Welcome to the eighth video in the Marine Invertebrate Biology course. This is the third video in Cnidaria, Phylum Cnidaria. And we start where we left off, which was talking about Portuguese men of war, which are a colonial hydrozoan and then the class hydrozoa. And we start with this particular individual. This is one individual animal within a colony. Uh, it is a uh, single, it's one of the exceptions to the rules. This individual doesn't have tentacles with stinging cells. It relies on other individuals within the colony to catch prey and share the food with it. So this one is called a nematophore. Nematophore. And that is a type of individual. Other types of individuals that uh, exist within this colony. There are specialized zoids. Okay, a zoid is an animal, a single individual animal, and they are specialized for different tasks. And these are the three. So a gastrozoid, gastro we've seen before, you see this root, stomach. These ones are specialized for digestion. They are they digest the food that the dactylozoid, which is if we look at right here, here's one polyp, and here would be another. Okay, and these ones are specialized for hunting. So that's going to be these tentacles that are that are dripping down. They're the ones that are catch prey, but then once they catch it, they will pass the food to the gastrozoids, which will I'll put it into their uh, guts digest it. They are uh, specialized to, and just for a very efficient digestion, and then they'll share the food with the rest of the colony. And then there's another type of, oh, here we go, dactylozoid. So that's the second kind of zoid. And then the third type of zoid or polyp within this colony are the gonozoids, which are these um, particular uh, individuals and they are specialized for uh, reproduction. They produce gametes. They produce either eggs or sperm and they will broadcast spawn those. Uh, as we start to see spe specialization, we can start to see how organs and um, more specialized tissues will evolve later in some of the other phyla that we see. So they can be up to a couple of meters in size, but most of the hydrozoans are very small. They're in freshwater and uh, marine. And they, if they have a colony, uh, they often will have an envelope, this um, uh, sheet. It's like an apartment building that all the little polyps live within. And it is a, uh, it's made of something called chitin. And we'll talk about chitin uh, later on with arthropod exoskeletons. And we see that the same materials are often used in different individuals, different species uh, to perform different functions. Okay, so this is a repeat of gastrozoids, gonozoids, dactylozoids. You can freeze this and make a note about these different polyps. And here's an image where we see the chitinous envelope or the apartment building that these uh, that this colony lives within, and in this area here is a gastrozoid. But in this particular type of uh, colony, this species of uh, hydrozoan, the gastrozoids also catch the food. So there are only two types of polyps in this colony. We have ones that are specialized. Right here, you can see the eggs within it it's for um, making babies and then the ones that hunt and digest food and those ones are the ones that share the the food with the gonozoids in order to um, make more efficiency uh, in terms of reproduction they have a, po a couple of different possibilities they, they can eat reproduct they can reproduce asexually by budding, or they may reproduce sexually 
where they produce uh, sperm and eggs. And then anytime you see this term gametes, that is a um, cell that is split in half and it will carry only half the genetic information. So when it combines with a, another cell that has half the, ger the genetic information from another parent, they combine now they have the full complement of genetic information uh, and what we call those cells once they've split in half are sperm or eggs okay they're gametes so sometimes a medusa can be released from a uh, sessile polyp something that's attached and it can swim off and produce eggs and sperm okay and they uh, can be fertilized and within the medusa develop into planula larva which are released and settle on the substrate and then a new polyp will grow and asexually butt off into a here is what a here's an image of how that goes so the medusa will butt off and it will be a male or female uh and so that they could be one of either and they'll produce uh, eggs or sperm. Uh, often they'll produce sperm, which can uh, fertilize an egg with that is brooded within the medusa. The eggs are released. So this is a good way of having a dispersal phase. The eggs are released and then um, they um, might meet up with a, a sperm outside the medusa as well. So there are different strategies in different species. Once the egg is uh, fertilized, then it turn, it morphs into a planula, so which swims around, finds a place that is suitable to settle through chemical, physical cues. It knows that it's a good place to grow, and then um, grows. It starts growing into a hydrozoan colony, and eventually, we'll get multiple types of um, polyps growing off of it, and it can get quite large. All right, that's it for uh, the class Hydrozoa. We're going to move to class Scyphozoa. Okay, Scyphozoa are true jellyfish, and they are pelagic. So pelagic means uh, wandering around in the water column, not attached to the bottom, not associated with the bottom. And here's a nice picture of what a, a jellyfish looks like. But they take lots and lots of beautiful forms. Huge amount of diversity, diversity uh, within the night area. Okay, um, they're a little bit more complex than hydrozoans. Uh, the hydrozoans are the simplest of the all, of the classes of um, cnidarians, and they are more specialized for their midwater life, life cycle. They are larger, and so they will have a thick Mesoglea. So when you start thinking about the size of the of jellyfish, they can get quite big, but again, they only have the two tissue layers, one at the outside and one at the inside. So there's a, a big area that's flexible and yet um, non-living. So let's have another look at the cutaway diagram. Uh, we have already gone through a lot of this. Um, in the uh, first video explaining the body form of the polyp and the medusa. Uh, there are a couple of different things to notice though. You, the, you have the gastroderm, mesoglea, epidermis. They have their gonads within the stomach and then, which is amazing since they, it seems like they could quite easily be abraded by prey that's in the stomach or uh, they also have to deal with uh, gastric digestive juices. But this is where they are, and then they can pump gametes out of the manubrium or the mouth uh, and when it's time to breed. Okay, so uh, we also see this really interesting development, called, and this little cyst right here uh, with a space in it. And the interesting thing about these things is that jellyfish are feeding on uh, little uh, individuals that uh, plankton, zooplankton generally, 
that feed on phytoplankton, phytoplankton being um, uh, plants, essentially like uh, single-celled algae that grow in the water and produce their own food, which are fairly abundant. They're abundant at the surface where there's light, but they're not abundant where it's deep. So if this is a um, an individual that feeds on zooplankton, that feed on the phytoplankton, where is all their food? It's near the top of the water column. So if a jellyfish swims down into the deeps, it's swimming away from its food and they need to have a, a system where they can uh, know that they're, no, I mean, they're not conscious supposedly, but where they are able to orient themselves so they stay near the surface. This is what that cyst looks like when you look at it closely. So what have we got here? Let's get our little pointer up. Our, this is called a stato cyst. Okay. When you talk about stasis, uh, we've already covered cyst. Okay. But when you talk about stasis, stasis means staying the same. Okay. Um, and this will help you, if you're a jellyfish, remain at the same orientation within the water column. So what do we have? We have a whole lot of nerve cells. This is a nerve cell, right? And we see this uh, uh, nerve fiber going off to the nerve net within the, the jellyfish. They don't have a brain, they have a neural network, okay? But uh, so they, they have this, they have lots of these nerves going off to the neural network from the status cyst. So this individual cell here, okay, and you can see this whole cyst, this little ball is lined with lots of these little sensory hairs. So that's what these things are. Okay, and it's just like if you take uh, your arm right now, your forearm, and you blow across the forearm, you know that wind is happening uh, you can feel the breath, and the reason you can feel your breath, the breath, is because if you imagine that this is the pore in your skin, right, and you have a hair growing out of it, so when you blow on it, let's say you're blowing this way, it stretches this hair this way, so the hair moves across, and what there are are these little sensors in here that get stretched and all of those little sensors these little sensory cells send signals off to your brain and the same thing is happening here inside this um, cyst the whole inside is lined all of this area is lined with these little hairs and when the the uh, jellyfish is oriented uh, correctly so that uh, it's going swimming up towards the surface. All these little things called statoliths, okay, and when you see the root term lith, that means rock, okay? All right, and so these are little mineral uh, rocks. They're calcium carbonate, and they um, will sit inside the middle of the cyst, and they will sit on these hairs and then deform the hairs underneath which the, they lay. So gravity just pulls them to the bottom of wherever the, the orientation of the jellyfish is. So what happens if the jellyfish turns upside down and it starts to swim towards the bottom? Then what happens is those uh, statoliths will now be up here at the top stimulating these hairs, right? And that means, that tells the jellyfish, whoops, I better start pumping on one side and not on the other until I turn myself. The statoliths will roll back down to the, the point which um, uh, the jellyfish no, knows that it's it oriented the correct way and it will uh, then start to swim back up towards the surface. And these are called statocysts. All right, let's look at the life cycle of um, reproduction in certain jellyfish. Okay, so jellyfish can have a, we said that they're planktonic or they're uh, 
they're up, they live up in the water column. And so they, but they can sometimes have a benthic phase. They can have a portion of their life cycle which is benthic. Now, let's start with the adult jellyfish, the medusa, and it produces eggs or sperm which fertilize themselves or fertilize each other. And the egg will morph just like we saw in the cnidarian, or sorry, in the uh, hydrozoans into a planula larva. And then it can settle on the bottom and look just like a hydrozoan uh, sitting on the bottom. It can look a, just like an anemone. It attaches to the bottom of the pedal disc and then starts catching food with its tentacles and then and growing there and living there like an anemone or a hydrozoan. And but then what happens is the thing can turn into what's called a strobilia. Well, this this first stage is called a scyphostoma. It can turn into a strobilia, and a strobilia is essentially like a stack of plates. If you think about it, it's still hunting with its tentacles, but it produces all of these little uh, stacks, these little individuals, which are buds and clones of each other. Okay, so this is a asexual portion of the reproductive cycle, but all of those, they're stacked on top of each other like a stack of plates. But then when uh, it's time to reproduce, uh, there'll be some environmental cue that says, this is a really good time. Your offspring, if they swim away, will actually have the best chance of survival. Let's say the water's just warming up and we know that there's going to be, uh, or the light levels are coming up. We know that there's going to be a phytoplankton bloom. There'll be a lot of uh, zooplankton feeding on those. And that's going to be a really good time for you to uh, give your offspring the best chance of survival because there's going to be food around. So these things will break off and swim away and they can morph into a whole new adult Medusa. Now, it is also possible that the planula larva will just become an ephyra and stay in the water column and not have the benthic life stage. So that we'll go through these slides. These ones are just uh, repeats of what we just talked about, a little more detail if you want to go slowly. Here is a picture of what a whole lot of uh, strobilia look like when they're just about to release. So you can get these massive jellyfish blooms because every one of those, every one of those has a massive amount of uh, these phyra ready to swim away, which can lead to huge jellyfish blooms. So many that you can clog intakes of nuclear power stations and the like. So that is the end of uh, this third Nidaria video, and we will talk about the last class, Anthozoa, in the fourth.